Hello, and welcome. My name is Suzanne, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Sonos Fiscal Second Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Thank you. Cameron McLaughlin, Vice President, Investor Relations, you may begin your conference. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to Sonos Second Quarter Fiscal 2020 Earnings Conference Call. I am Cameron McLaughlin, and with me today are Sonos CEO Patrick Spence and CFO Brittany Bagley. For those joining the call early, today's hold music comes from a playlist that is included in our shareholder letter, with music from many of the artists that Sonos has worked with thus far in 2020 including those featured on Sonos Radio. Before I hand the call over to Patrick, I'd like to remind everyone that today's discussion will include forward-looking statements regarding future events and our future financial performance. These statements reflect our views as of today only and should not be considered as representing our views of any subsequent date. These statements are also subject to material risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from expectations reflected in the forward-looking statements. A discussion of these risk factors is fully detailed under the caption risk factors in our filings with the SEC. During this call, we may also refer to several non-GAAP financial measures, including growth margin and adjusted EBITDA, excluding the impact of tariffs, adjusted EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA margin, and free cash flow. For complete information regarding our non-GAAP financial information and a reconciliation of those measures, please refer to today's shareholder letter regarding our second quarter fiscal 2020 results posted to the Investor Relations portion of our website. I will now turn the call over to Patrick. Thank you, Cameron, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of everybody at Sonos, we sincerely hope you're managing your way through these challenging times, and our thoughts go out to all those impacted by this global pandemic. Since the pandemic hit, our immediate priorities have been to support our people, serve our customers, and ensure we weather the storm and emerge stronger. We transitioned to working from home in mid-March and have quickly seen how resilient, adaptable, and agile our people are. Our team has risen to the challenge and maintained an incredible level of productivity and teamwork despite the stresses of stay-at-home orders and life in general. This is evidenced by the fact we launched Sonos Radio on April 21st and are announcing three new products today. We have long instilled a learn and adjust culture and that approach is resonating as we creatively and quickly solve for the needs of our customers, colleagues, and communities. As you can see from our Q2 results and the early Q3 trends, we are operating in volatile and unpredictable times. We're confident that we're well positioned for the long term and we will emerge stronger from this crisis, but the short term visibility is challenging, which is why we're withdrawing our prior fiscal 2020 guidance at this time. Our second quarter was challenging as we experienced a 17% year over year decline in revenue. Coming off a strong first quarter, we had been expecting some softness in the second quarter. Q2 is usually the quarter where retail retail partners rebalance their inventories after the holiday quarter. We typically see few orders early in the quarter, and then our partners replenish later in the quarter. This Q2, we saw one of our large U.S. retail partners and our German distributor doing this rebalancing, but we did not see the replenishments later in the quarter as the COVID-19 pandemic hit and everyone started to close stores and focus on health and safety. This led to a 23% year-over-year decline in revenue in March specifically. Despite this, we continued to gain share in the streaming home audio category in the U.S. and U.K. and maintained a leadership position during the quarter, which we attribute to the quality of our products and the strength of our brand. Our continued focus and investment in our direct-to-consumer efforts paid off as we saw a 32% year-over-year increase in our revenue through direct-to-consumer channels in Q2. In April, the first month of our Q3, direct-to-consumer revenue accelerated to approximately 400% year-over-year growth. Of of course, most physical retail locations were closed in April, which made it a challenging sales environment to begin with, but we wanted to help make people's lives a little more joyful while they were spending more time at home. So we threw out our original plans, and on April 2nd, we launched a digital campaign, At Home with Sonos, with some tips on how to get the most out of your Sonos and targeted promotional offers that ran through May 5th. The other encouraging data point from April was that Move was one of our top selling products and it did not have a promotional offer associated with it. This underscores that our products are resonating with consumers and uh, that our brand is premium positioned. 
Thanks to the success of our direct-to-consumer efforts, we expect that our total revenue in April, April will decline less than 5% year-over-year. We're pretty pleased with this given the physical retail was closed for the month. It is hard to know what the next few months will bring, and we don't view either March or April as indicative of our natural run rate, but it illustrates that our products and brand are resonating with consumers during this time. One of the most illustrative data points on how strong engagement was in April was listening hours. We experienced a 48% year-over-year increase in listening hours in the month of April. We're proud that we've been able to make life at home a little more joyful for the more than 10 million homes that we're in today. Innovation remains the core of Sonos both in the products we build and the culture that fuels it. We design products and experiences that are easy to use, deliver brilliant sound, and give users the freedom of choice when it comes to voice and music services. Today, we are excited to announce the launch of Sonos Arc, Five, and Sub. Arc is our premium smart soundbar that brings immersive cinema, cinema quality sound to your home with features like support for Dolby Atmos. Following the many years of success with our Play Bar and category leadership, we are thrilled to bring a new premium soundbar to market. This is our best soundbar yet and really epitomizes what we're all about. It's the choice for anyone who loves movies and music. The 5 is our most powerful speaker, delivering the same studio quality sound as the beloved Play 5 and bringing increased memory, processing power, and a new wireless radio. It also features a stunning new front grille. Our new sub features the same iconic design and bold base as its predecessor, but upgrades it with increased memory, processing power, and more. Arc 5 and Sub will be available this June. We continue to explore the role services play in the future of Sonos and continue to experiment with new business models like we have done in the past with Flex and Sonos for Business. We also continue to see long-term opportunities to expand upon our partnership model and remain pleased with our partnerships with IKEA and Sonance. As you saw in late April, we launched Sonos Radio. We had seen that our consumers were spending nearly half of all listening time on Sonos listening to radio content. Inspired by and built for Sonos owners, Sonos Radio is a free, ad-supported radio service available in the Sonos app. Streaming music, news, sports, and original Sonos programming, Sonos Radio integrates a growing list of 60,000 radio stations into one place. Since, since launch, a significant number of Sonos households have listened to Sonos Radio and has quickly risen up the ranks and become the sixth most used service on the Sonos platform. While the short term is unpredictable, I'm confident that we're well positioned for the long term and we will emerge from this crisis well positioned to drive sustainable, profitable growth. I will now turn the call over to Brittany. Thank you, Patrick. As we have discussed over the last few quarters, Sonos has been focused on balancing strong top line growth and increasing profitability with the need to continue to invest in our business and future products. Despite the significant challenges this quarter and the potential long-term impact from the global pandemic, that is still our priority. Because of that sustainable, profitable growth, we continue to be in a position of strength today where we can focus on what is best for the long-term business in addition to taking the necessary short-term action. We also believe that a prudent balance sheet, along with M&A and share repurchases, is the right capital allocation strategy and today that philosophy is serving us well. We ended the second quarter with $283 million in cash and cash equivalents and very minimal long-term debt. We also have in place an $80 million undrawn revolver, providing even further flexibility. We have run a variety of scenarios, as you can imagine, and are confident in our cash position, even if a weak economic condition persists. During the second quarter, we used $83.5 million in cash from operations, largely due to the timing of inventory payables following our holiday quarter. Q2 is typically a seasonal low quarter for cash. As we look at the rest of the year, we continue to focus on managing our cash and preserving our strong balance sheet. We also repurchased approximately $30 million of our stock early in the quarter. We currently have approximately $17 million remaining under the $50 million repurchase authorization. In March, we took action to review our planned investments for the year and made adjustments to preserve flexibility and liquidity while continuing to support our critical business needs. As you have seen, we have adjusted our marketing approach, both by reducing certain planned investments while also launching the At Home with Sonos campaign. We have taken steps to manage our inventory more tightly given the end market weakness 
and eliminated many discretionary expenses beyond just travel and typical in-office expenses. We are focused on having a lower operating expense run rate in the second half of fiscal 2020 as compared to the first half, which means we have also paused on some of the continuing hiring and investments we were making. You should expect some variability around sales and marketing given the timing of events in Q3, including our promotion and new product launches. We are confident that these are the right measures to take at this time, but will continue to review and adjust as we learn more over the coming weeks and months. Revenue in the second quarter decreased 17%, or 16% on a constant currency basis, to $175 million. Coming off a strong first quarter, we had highlighted that we were expecting some softness in the second quarter from demand pull-in. As Patrick noted, we also saw challenges, primarily from a large partner in the U.S. rebalancing inventory, as well as weakness in our German market from inventory rebalancing with our distributor. Overall, across all of our markets, there was a significant impact in March from the weakened global demand environment and broad-based physical retail closures stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic. This impacted both end demand and replenishment orders from our partners in the majority of our end markets. As a result, our revenue in March declined 23%. Sono speaker revenue represented 66% of total revenue during the second quarter and decreased 27% from the prior year. We believe this category was more significantly impacted by inventory rebalancing measures and the effects of COVID-19 on consumer demand. In contrast, our Sono system products revenue, which represented 27% of total revenue during the quarter, increased 22% year over year, driven by the performance of Sonos AMP and the launch of Sonos Port in late fiscal 2019. Partner products and other revenue increased 4%, driven primarily by our IKEA and Sonance partnerships, which launched in the second quarter of fiscal 2019. In April, as discussed, we launched our At Home with Sonos program. We thought it was important to get back in front of consumers with relevant messaging and opportunities during this challenging time. As Patrick mentioned, Sonos Move was one of our best-selling products, even without a promotion. We have seen an increasing percentage of our sales shift to online purchasing during the quarter given the physical retail closures. Our direct-to-consumer revenue during the second quarter increased 32% year-over-year. We saw this further accelerate in April with approximately 400% year-over-year growth in our direct-to-consumer channel. Overall, April is showing meaningfully better trends compared to March. We expect total revenue in April to decline less than 5% year-over-year. We are very pleased with these results given physical retail remains mostly closed. This represents a big shift in consumer buying behavior for our products, primarily to the online channel. This is also improving our inventory position relative to Q2. Gross margin during the second quarter declined 130 basis points due to the introduction of tariffs in September 2019. Excluding the effect of tariffs, gross margin would have increased 230 basis points to 45.3%. Total tariff expenses through the first half of the year were approximately $26 million. We have not experienced any lasting impact due to COVID-19 as it relates to our manufacturing capacity. Currently, we still expect to complete our supply chain diversification into Malaysia by the end of the year. We have also submitted a request for exclusion from list 4A and are hopeful that we will obtain a positive outcome. As a reminder, since February 13th, we have been subject to a 7.5% tariff on goods imported from China. Now for a little more color on OPEX. During the second quarter of fiscal 2020, GAAP operating expenses increased 11% on a year-over-year -year basis. While we made some significant reductions starting in March, we had also been investing for long-term growth. Overall, the majority of the increase is driven by higher headcount in our R&D organization as we continue to invest in new products and features. Research and development expenses increased 24% to $49.6 million. This includes the addition of the SNPs team. Sales and marketing expenses increased 2% to $50.5 million, and G&A expenses increased 9% to $26.1 million, primarily due to an increase in legal fees related to our IP litigation. 
Excluding the $1.7 million in IP litigation fees during the quarter, G&A expenses increased 2%. Year-to-date, we have generated adjusted EBITDA of $64.8 million. Adjusted EBITDA for the quarter was a loss of $28.4 million. As we look forward to the rest of the year, we don't know what a normal run rate for our business looks like, when physical retail will reopen, or how the economy will recover. Given the uncertainty, unpredictability, and volatility, we are withdrawing our previously issued revenue, gross margin, and adjusted EBITDA guidance for fiscal 2020. Despite the challenging environment, we are excited about what we have seen from our five-week at Home with Sonos campaign, the ongoing engagement from our customers, and the launch of ARC 5 Sub and Sonos Radio. We believe that the strength of our balance sheet allows us to continue making prudent investments, and the resiliency of our teams as they continue to operate from home allow us to continue delivering great experiences. We believe we are well-positioned and capitalized to create value over the long term. And with that, we will open the line for questions. Thank you. In order to ask a question, simply press star, the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes in line with Kathy Herberty of Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope you all are are, are staying healthy and safe. Uh, a couple of questions from me. Does the incredible success of the direct channel in the month of April change your thinking about the path to market for your business over the long run? And how do you think about the advantages of having that direct customer relationship versus the advantages of, of having a, a larger uh, third-party store network. Hey, Katie, it's Patrick. I'll take that one. Um, yeah, I think the in times like these, I think what happens is trends that were already underway accelerate in a big way. And as you know, you know, the last two years, we've our fastest-growing channel has been our DTC channel, and it and it goes to the type of product that we create, but as well the importance that we see around our brand and. You know, I think the day-to-day engagement through the system, the kind of listening hours we see, and as well the engagement and why, you know, we're experimenting a bit with Sonos Radio is that ongoing engagement with our customers. And it, it all comes together, right, in terms of how people use the product and then as well how they add another Sonos product to their system. So I do – we've invested in it. We're going to continue to. You know, if you would have told me that we could grow DTC the way we did in April and – yeah, you know, and it wasn't without some bumps in terms of like a little longer hold times on the phone for people that were doing telesales, and you know, like we had some delayed shipments through there. But all in all, it was amazing to deliver that level of growth, and uh, you know, and, and be able to satisfy customer demand was just um, very encouraging for the future. And so, I do think it's an important part of the future. And uh, you know, this is one of those times where you take stock of the strategy and how much more do you put. Um, you know, your foot on the gas around these kind of things. And so it definitely makes me think this is going to be an even bigger part of our future. And it also, you know, it also points out that in these kind of times, you know, we are we are the ones that ultimately, uh, you know, made sure that we're getting people a product quickly and, and it's all about um, trying to deliver to the customers as best as possible. There were a lot of distractions from the other channels, right, in going through this. And so, um, you know, some are focused on essential goods and those kind of things. And so we, you know, it's something that we think is important. We think we can meet the customer demand. And I think strength, strengthens the brand for the long term and, and is obviously good for the bottom line as well. So, you know, you, we are definitely thinking how we continue to uh, build on this uh, into the future. That's great. And then a follow-up, Brittany, how should we – think just qualitatively about the remainder of the quarter. Obviously, the the promotion uh, ended May May 5th, but then you have three new products shipping for, you know, the the second half of, of June. Do you think there will be enough sell-in that, you know, we could see some strength off those new products? It's a great question, Katie. I mean, I think one of our challenges in looking forward, even for the rest of the quarter, has been that 
you know, the two months that we really have, March and April, have behaved so differently. Um, and so, you know, obviously part of that was probably people were really getting their heads around what this meant in March. And, you know, in hindsight, you know, there was probably some of this that even started in February as people started anticipating this given other things going on around the world. Um, but with all of that, you know, the, the sort of drastic difference we saw in April makes it really hard for, you know, us to predict what else we think is going to happen in Q3. So we've got the headwinds of uh, physical retail continuing to be closed. Who knows when that's going to reopen? And then you've got the balance from us of this strength in our DTC channel, the new products coming out. And, you know, as I, as I mentioned, we're ending April in a much better inventory position. So when do we start to see some of those um, orders and replenishment orders coming into Q3? So, you know, I, with all of that, those, those are sort of the factors we're thinking through. And, and one of the reasons it's really hard to guide or, or get a good handle on what the rest of Q3 or the year will look like. Okay. Thank you. Um, Patrick, can I just squeeze one more in, high level? Sure. How would you describe the differentiation of Sonos Radio versus other music streaming services? And do you see it as cannibalistic of the other platforms or more of a complementary service? Absolutely complementary. You know, there, there's always been the radio service on Sonos. We hadn't touched it in 15 years. We've, what we've done is use it as an opportunity to showcase what's possible in our app now. Um, obviously, there's the monetization benefits on advertising, and so we're you know, putting our um, toe in the water on services, which we're excited about. But it also does present the opportunity for partners to showcase their certain playlists or stations and those types of things. And so I think it's going to be very complimentary. And, it, and again, it allows us to showcase the best of Sonos and how an integrated solution can be and show our partners what's possible um, with their app inside the Sonos ecosystem. So I think it's... Um, you know, good all around. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. And our next question comes to the line of John Babcock of Bank of America. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Actually, I just wanted to follow up on um, the question on kind of the fiscal third quarter here. Um, you know I, know, I know you're not really willing to provide guidance, but I thought, you know, maybe you might be able to provide us some sense as to how revenues kind of trended through April and into the first part of May here. And then also, uh, you know, I think you mentioned that your inventories have, uh, you know, kind of rebalanced, but also want to get a sense for where they stand right now. Yeah, John, so as we look at revenue in April, it's down less than 5% year over year. So that's a pretty big contrast to our down 23% in March. And, uh, you know, yes, it's still down, but I think we're pretty happy with that number given how much of physical retail has really remained closed. So you're, we're just seeing a huge shift in demand to online and DTC. So that's really the best color we can give on, on Q3 uh, because that's what we know. It's sort of, it's, it's less of an unwillingness at this point and more of it's just really hard to predict what, what the future will look like even a month from now. Okay, that's fair. Um, and then, you know, just with regards to the growth in the direct consumer business, and, and I know we kind of already asked about this as well, but, um, you know, I mean, generally, where do, how large is that now as a percent of sales? Is that kind of 15%? Is that kind of in the ballpark? And also, how sustainable do you believe that that growth actually is, you know, as you as we kind of move beyond the pandemic here? Yeah, so we didn't disclose it as a percentage of sales um, for this quarter. We just gave you the growth numbers. Uh, it was last at 12% uh, of sales in fiscal year 19, so that's the last percentage of sales number we got, and so you can triangulate a bit from there. Um, you know, in terms of sustainability, I think it, we're very pleased with the results, and as Patrick was talking about, we're going to work hard to um, make sure that, that we can keep some of that continued momentum in the DTC business, but you know, part of that will depend on how permanently have consumer buying habits changed and when do they want to go back into the physical retail stores and, you know, is this a permanent trend for the consumer? And so I think we're going to have to wait and see a lot on how consumer buying behavior actually changes coming out of this environment. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. And our next question comes to the line of Rod Hall or Goldman Sachs. The line is open. Yeah, hi guys. Thanks for the question. Um, I guess, Brittany, I wanted to start with you and just see if you could answer um, 
that I know that Patrick in his comments talked about the U.S. distribution channel, a U.S. retail partner, and then the German um, distributor not reloading on inventory. And I wondered if that inventory reload occurred in April or do you anticipate it to, to occur in the next couple months, you know, the end of this quarter, or do you just not know? That's the first question, then I have a follow-up to that. Yeah, uh, so we're characterizing it as a bit of rebalancing from, so it's two things. There was inventory rebalancing that went on, um, which I think uh, we had called in our, our Q1 that we did think there was some demand pull in and, and we were trying to get a view on, on some softness in Q2. And so we did see some inventory rebalancing from those two partners. What we then saw was you know, COVID-19 hit and a real drop off in demand so that the end markets were much weaker. And then with the closure of physical retail and everyone being much more careful about how much inventory they held, we saw a lack of replenishment orders. Um, and, you know, with weaker demand, there was also enough inventory that everyone had. So as we come through April, uh, we think we're in a much better inventory position. Uh, we think that that sets us up well to start getting replenishment orders. But, you know, it's kind of anyone's guess on when those will really come in. It'll depend on the retailer, the channel, you know, when does physical actually reopen, how well is each retailer doing with their online sales, how are they seeing demand. Um, so there's a bunch of factors that, that make it hard for us to call when that will happen. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And then I, I wanted to come back to this point of direct distribution, Patrick, and see, I mean, obviously this is, it's unfortunate this has all happened, but in a way, um, lucky from a direct distribution point of view, I guess. And I wonder if you have any ideas or how you might keep people on that platform in the future, since it's such a attractive distribution methodology for you, both I think from a brand point of view, as well as a a financial point of view. Yeah, thanks, Rod. And I think the you know the thing that we've learned is people are willing to purchase audio products in a big way online, so they're they're not having to listen you know necessarily as we go through it. So people found, and we saw through the data, people were comparing like the shipment times too, right through this period. So it's kind of it's a I think the proposition has to be. Um, in this day and age, how quickly are you going to get it, you know, from a partner? And when we were in a position where it was quickest to get it from Sonos for sure, um, obviously in terms of going through this, we, as well, our customers, we communicated a lot in terms of how Sonos could help in your home office, how it can help you enjoy all that, you know, all of the video streaming um, that you're uh, watching and how Beam plays into that, the home cinema side, all of these things. And we, we communicated like never before um, in the month of April as well. And I hear from a lot of our customers, and I did not hear that we over communicated. And so I think that ongoing communication about what we're doing um, is actually a really important learning from the month of April as well. And, you know, our product was born of the home and built for this time. And, it, you know, and so we're, I'm very proud of the fact that we're bringing joy to people's homes you know, in this time. And so I think we've learned that we can engage even more with our customers. The other thing that we had and we saw was people trading up, right, to get to the new products, I think, as people were home and saying, you know what, now's the time I'm going to move from that product that, uh, you know, I bought 15 years ago to the new amp or the new port, right, as I go through that. And so I think helping our customers with that journey, um, keep it, letting them know that there's something new there, that engagement's important. I think things like Sonos Radio and being able to serve up um, as well messages through that um, vehicle as well is going to help in terms of that you know engagement. And so there's always a balance between when it becomes annoying right, to customers for some of these things. But I, I think we've learned we can engage more with our customers and they will respond by going to Sonos.com. And from a hygiene perspective, being really good about the service we're providing there um, is going to be critical. And I'm glad, like we, you know, we invested a lot in terms of building that out over the last couple of years and making sure that we could, um, you know, address a spike in DTC demand. I mean, who could have imagined it would be 
a 400% spike, but, you know, that we could do this. And so we're going to continue to do that. We'll look at, like, making sure we have the technology in place to do it, um, what the best-in-class companies are doing. But I think all of this stuff is self-reinforcing. And we'll see very shortly, you know, what kind of demand we get for uh, our premium soundbar as well, um, you know, basically sight on scene um, and where our brand is. But I think we're uniquely positioned as a brand where people trust us and trust that it will be good sound. Um, and they also know that if you know necessary, they can return it, right? And that's not going to be an issue. We did push the other thing I would say, Rod, is we did push on to make sure people understand we have a money back guarantee. So if they want to do that, it'll we'll easily take it back, you know. And so there's no, um, you know, there's no friction there at all. And so pushing on some of those hygiene things has actually been even more important. Uh, and I think we need to be thoughtful about that going forward. Great. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. And our next question comes to the line of Matt Sheeran of Siebel. Your line is open. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, uh, Patrick, just a, a follow-up regarding your comments about uh, the upgrade uh, program. You've got uh, three new products uh, coming out. You also have uh, your new app and operating system uh, unveiling uh, next month, which would also appear to be you know, a catalyst uh, to, to, to prompt people to, to upgrade. So could you talk about uh, what you're seeing there in terms of that upgrade program and, you know, whether the new app, uh, you know, will be a catalyst or, or will be, um, you know, uh, helpful there? Uh, yeah, hey Matt, I think it'll be, I think it will be, and you know um, from our history, like we haven't really been through these cycles, uh, I think, because we try to build products that, you know, last for a long, long time. And, and probably the best example right now, we're going through our, um, with AMP and Port, right, and um, replacing, you know, products from uh, 12 to 15, that we launched 12 to 15 years ago. And so um, I think the, given the, the thing I would point you to is the level of engagement and the listening on Sonos over these two months has been incredible. The quick, you know, jump up the charts at Sonos Radio shows the engagement level there. And then with the DTC brand and engagement and trade up. And so, that is that is something we've just started the journey on. We launched the program, um, you know, late last year. In terms of what was there, we tested it. We made sure we could go and deliver it. We made some adjustments, right? We uh, we didn't get it right with recycle mode when we first launched the program, so we uh, changed that up and listened to customers and changed that up. And then through this period, I think we're learning there is appetite there, and you know, we'll, we it's a little early to you know really build that in as we think about the future, but. Um, It'll be it'll be interesting to see what we learn because you know we won't be pushing on people to replace their play bar with an arc, but we have so many avid fans, and I I can tell you from having done it in my own home, it is night and day difference, right? The arc just takes it um, to a whole new level. It'll be really interesting to see what we learn on how um, you know that drives over time and what our customers really want to do here. But um, I'm pleased with where we are on the trade up cycle, and and you know what. S2 um, that you referenced the the S2 that we're rolling out our new OS and app, you know, just sets us up well for the future and to be bringing more innovation to the platform through high res audio and some of those other things that I think will help us over time bring even more customers up to the newer products. And so, um, so I'm excited about what we're doing on that front. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's helpful. And and just a question uh, on uh, on the gross margin. I know there's a lot uh, going on here. You had that. Uh, promotion in the month of April, which sounds like it was very successful. You also have still some uh, headwinds on tariffs and you know, manufacturing shifting um, out of China. Uh, so could you talk about uh, how we should think about gross margin? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I would say, you know, we have been providing it with and without tariffs to start. So that's, that's sort of the, the biggest Delta in terms of how we've been talking about it. From a manufacturing standpoint, you know, we still think that we will diversify uh, for our U.S. bound production into Malaysia by the end of the year. Now, I say that sitting where we are today, there's a lot that has to go into, you know, the world getting back to normal at some point um, to make sure we can make that a smooth transition. But from where we sit today, we still see that happening by the end of the year, and then if that happens, you know, we will not be subject to tariffs anymore unless, you know, the tariff program shifts. Uh, 
We're at a 7.5% tariff now, so it went down as of February 13th from the 15% we were paying before. And then we have also applied for an exemption. And so, you know, optimistically, we would hope to get that exemption, and then that would be another mitigant on the tariff factor. But there's sort of multiple ways where we're working to remove tariffs from the mix from a gross margin standpoint. Um, without tariffs, we were at a 45.3% gross margin for the quarter. That is higher than, you know, our general long-term guidance of 42 to 44%. And what you're seeing there is really how we're doing from a product mix standpoint. Um, and then we had some benefit from channel mix in the quarter as well. So going forward where we land on that margin you know, framework will really depend on the mix of the products we're selling, the mix of the channels we're in, how good a job we're doing at negotiating down our material costs. Um, obviously, the higher our volume, the more leverage we have on some of those negotiations. And so those are the things that we're looking at as we go forward. Um, obviously, we're, we're pulling guidance, so we're not really providing any updated guidance for gross margin at this point either. But those, those are the factors that um, are worth thinking through as you think through what could happen to our gross margin in future quarters. Yeah. Uh, understood. And if there's one last question I can uh, sneak in here just regarding uh, the Sonos radio, which sounds like that's been also successful uh, to begin with. Um, could you talk about uh, sort of the, the P&L model there and what should we think about it in terms of um, contributing to profitability or is that more sort of a marketing uh, customer engagement type of model uh, that we should be thinking about? It's probably too early to talk about that one. Um, we really just launched it and so as, as we scale the model and, and see what kinds of reactions we get and how our customers react and all of that, then I think we'll be more prepared to talk a little bit about that very reasonable question in later quarters, but it's just too early in terms of uh, our launch. Fair enough. Okay, thanks very much. And your next question comes the line of Adam Tyndale of Rayma James. The line is open. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, Patrick, I just wanted to start on the shift in consumer buying behavior to online channels. I uh, just want to touch on kind of the opportunities and threats that it brings. I think you touched on some of the opportunities in the prepared remarks, specifically on the threats. Um, and you do have one competitor that dominates online search. You've got another competitor that dominates e-commerce. Um, doesn't look like it's impacting now, as you talked about gaining share in the quarter. The PPC is up significantly. But just wanted to give you a chance to maybe address that longer-term big picture concern on uh, those two major competitors. Yeah, thanks, Adam. I think the uh, you know there's there's a couple angles on that, right? One is um, one is what they're doing on the product side, and you know we've always talked about the fact that from a product perspective, they're trying to achieve something very different than we are. And you know through Q1 and Q2, it's been interesting because they haven't been as active in the marketplace, like even at the um, even for the pox um, as much. And so you know as I mentioned. But I think as we cited in our letter too, you know, Q, fiscal Q1 and fiscal Q2 in the um, streaming audio category, we've gained share in our major markets um, across both quarters. And so it's been, it's been interesting to see that because um, there, there hasn't been as much focus, and, and I would say from, from them. And um, so it's kind of interesting um, at the end of the day. And I, and I think we have to be prepared, and we are prepared that you know they come back at it a little bit more um, focused in the fall, right, uh, when the usual launch uh, things happen. But uh, we'll see, right, in terms of that front. And then I think when it comes to e-commerce, we've been very thoughtful about the way that we've created our channel mix and over the last two years our investments in DTC. So I am not, um, you know, I do not think that we are uh, unduly tied to any one partner. Uh, in all of this, online or offline, in terms of where we are, we value all of the relationships and the work and the value that um, you know our channels add. I think one of the channels that probably gets underappreciated, quite frankly, is our installed solutions channel that does a lot of the AMP and, and port work and a lot of the installations and um, you know. And so I think that that continues to be an important one um, in the future, and we do um, really well in that channel. It's helpful. As we go through it, I think the trend, I think physical retail, as we've seen on a more macro level, is pretty challenged in terms of not just the 
you know, the crisis, but the crisis just started to accelerate trends that were already in place. And I think, you know, from what I saw, uh, Best Buy did a good job in terms of the shift to curbside, but it doesn't pick up, you know, everything that um, they would have if physical was there. So there'll be a place for physical. But I am really bullish on our DTC coming off of this. And one of those consumer test points was how willing are people to purchase these products online without listening? And I think when you're engaging with a brand, the brand has enough awareness and a good reputation. It has the money-back guarantee. It has speedy delivery. And, um, you know, we've shown that people want to engage and want to engage directly with the brand. Um, and you build up that trust. And as you know, over time, build up the system, right? So continued purchases and getting into new homes at this point is very, very important. Uh, as we go through it, so um, they're there. You know, you, you, with the uh, with Amazon and Google, like there are always um, you know things that we're thinking about. But I think we've shown in April if we stay focused on the kind of customers we're going after and what's important to them, and we focus on our direct to consumer efforts, it is great for our brand and great for our business as well. And so um, we'll continue to invest. And I think the acceleration. I would say of many brands, like doing a little more direct to consumer through this, uh, is something that I, I think we'll see uh, more broadly as well. Okay, that, that's helpful. Thanks. And uh, Brittany, just as a follow up, I wanted to circle back to the comment about less than five percent year over year decline in April. If I heard you correctly, it doesn't sound like that was driven by some one time big replenishment boost or something like that. Um, the environment isn't getting worse in May incrementally. I know it's challenged. Um, you have three new products hitting in June. Are, are there offsets that I'm not thinking about here to where the June quarter could be worse than that 5% year-over-year decline that you're already experiencing in April? I think the big thing that went on in April, and it, it was really the first five weeks, but we ran our At Home with Sonos promotion campaign. And so I think the question will be, you know, that, that did a great job of getting us back in front of consumers with really compelling offers. And so as that campaign uh, is over as of yesterday, what does that look like for, you know, a normalized run rate in May and June? If, it hadn't, if, that, if we had had an April where we weren't running a campaign, I think we might have been able to say, okay, this might be a good sort of run rate base, but um, we really need to see how the reaction is when we're, when we're off the at-home with Sonos promotion campaign. Okay. And, just, and, uh, and the, one thing I just, the one thing I'd throw in there, too, Adam, is just that everyone was at home. Right. Um, you know, so, so it was, there were two kind of factors. One was, you know, promotion. We upped the level of communications and how people get the most out of their Sonos. But let's not forget as well, millions of people were, um, you know, stuck at home. And so we don't know as the, as some of these things begin to lift to like, do people, um, you know, w what's the behavioral change that we're going to see too. So I just, I just flag that. Got it. Everyone's asking three questions, so I might as well as well. Um, I, I was a little bit confused on April getting better, but then the decision to do the OPEX reduction. So maybe just talk about, you know, the, how, how you went through that. If, you know, if you've kind of gotten past the worst, April's getting better, why do we need to take actions on the cost structure right now? Uh, so we took our cost actions in the beginning of March. So when this hit, we tried to react, you know, pretty quickly to take some cost actions, and those were really, I mean, they're, they're things that sort of everyone has done, including, you know, people aren't traveling. We've been able to significantly reduce our in-office expenses. Um, and then, you know, we've also looked at ways we can bring down discretionary spending and all of that. Uh, we're really trying to strike the balance between uh, taking cost actions where we think it's prudent for the business while also continuing to invest in, you know, R&D and product and our future roadmap so that we come out of this, you know, pretty strongly. And I think the only sort of comment on future OPEX would be, you know, we don't have guidance to give. We don't know where Q3 will land. We don't know that it will land at that April number of less than 5%. So we need to keep watching and being flexible and nimble and balancing, you know, sort of the right decisions for the business from both a, a long-term investment standpoint and uh, an OPEX profitability cash flow standpoint. Understood. Thanks and best of luck. Thank you. 
And just a reminder, in order to ask a question, simply press stars on the number one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes to the line of Brent Hill of Jefferies. Your line is open. Great. Thanks for taking my question. It's it's James on for Brent. Um, just two. Uh, could you touch on the strength of Sona's move that you saw in April? Is there anything in particular that you'd call out that's driving that strength? Um, is it most of the DTC business? Just any color there would be helpful. Thanks. Hey, James. Uh, you know, I think it is, uh, as we've thought about it, I think, uh, you know, it wasn't on promotion, so I'd flag that, which is pretty interesting. But the obviously the other side of this is is it is becoming springtime and people are you know uh, going outside around their home and that kind of thing and so I think the you know we we are watching it closely but that probably has something to do with it um, as well it's been a a very well rated and reviewed product throughout we had seen um, some really good strength in um, Australia when we launched it you know there last fall when it was heading into Australia's summer, and so I think the seasonality is an interesting aspect of it. Um, I also think the versatility, as we had new homes come in and be thinking about which you know which product they're going to choose, Move is obviously one which has a degree of versatility that our other products do not. So I think they, I think you know the reasons we built the product uh, are starting to really prove out now, uh, which is pretty exciting uh, for us. And so we'll see how it trends through the rest of this. Um, spring and into summer period, but um, it, it's a it's a it's a really good green shoot right now. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. Thanks. Um, you know, just another one. Just curious how your supply chain is holding up given the shift to Malaysia. You know, I believe that they're they're still on lockdown. So just would just be you know curious to hear your from caller on what you're hearing from suppliers there and um, how we should think about that going forward. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're calling out that we don't think that there's a material or lasting impact to our supply chain from this. Uh, China's already back up and running. And then, you know, we are diversifying between China and Malaysia. And so we are continuing to go through that process. They are on lockdown right now, but they're, uh, I think, expected to open up again in the middle of May. And so from what we can see now, we would be on track for our diversification into Malaysia by uh, the end of our fiscal year, sort of consistent with our, our plans. But, uh, you know, if they do end up in lockdown for much longer, then we'll come back and, and update that view. But that is our best view based on current information. Great. Thank you both. And our next question comes from Elliot Alper of DA Davidson. Your line is open. Great, thanks. Uh, Wafer called out yesterday a bounce in sales as stimulus checks came through. Was curious if you at all saw this as uh, playing a role in better month in April. Uh, I wouldn't uh, call that out for our business specifically, but of course it can be hard to tell. Okay, um, and then you spoke about cash preservation. Um, still have some left on your repurchase authorization. How are you guys thinking about buybacks for the rest of the year? Yeah, I mean, I think in any environment, we don't really talk about the timing of when we plan to execute against our authorization. So we're very focused on liquidity and our cash balance right now. We continue to think that our stock is at uh, an attractive valuation level, and um, we're not pulling or um, – you know, suspending our repurchase program, and so we will we will see what makes the makes the most sense for us as we continue to work through that authorization. Great, appreciate it. And thank you. I'd now like to turn the call back to Patrick Spence for his closing remarks. Thanks, Suzanne, and thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, I know it's a uh, strange times, challenging times, so I really appreciate you taking the time given everything um, that's going on in the world right now. Um, I want to say thank you to our team who has stepped up um, in an incredible way to make sure we could launch radio and all the products today. Um, it's just been incredible to see um, our people uh, just persevering through this, uh, the creativity. We've had people you know, doing lab testing at home and, and makeshift labs in their kitchens, bathrooms. I mean, it's just been incredible to see. And I think that creativity um, and spirit sets us up well for the long term 
Um, and I'm just really proud that we've been able to, uh, you know, bring a little joy to people uh, in their homes during this period of time. And that's what we plan to continue to do. We've got some great new products as we go forward. We've got some um, experiments we're trying like radio. Um, so I think we're well set up for the future um, in the short term. A little hard to know what um, what's going to pan out. But uh, I'm very optimistic um, and think we're well positioned for the long term. So thank you again, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Take care. And this concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.